Be the first to know what's new on TJC. Breaking news, award-winning movies, exciting documentaries, and original series. Sign up for our free bi-weekly email program guide at TJCTV.com. Welcome to the Salon. Coming up, lessons from the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, what the 2012 elections mean for women, why sex education matters in the Orthodox community, and how to game J-Date to meet your mate. It's all up for discussion at the Salon. Hello, I'm Jane Eisner, Editor-in-Chief of The Forward and Forward.com. And I'm Rachel Sklar from Change the Ratio. And we welcome you to the Salon. So, Rachel, we've got like this election that happened. It's and exciting. Not, yes, the president's the same, House of Representatives seems the same, but the Senate, the change the ratio worked there, didn't it? I take full credit for the fact that there are now 20 women in the Senate more than ever before. Yeah, and it's very exciting, and not only that, it was sort of the change the ratio mm -hmm. election. Woman in the Senate, first openly gay female uh, senator, uh, m uh, marriage uh, votes on the, on the yeah. Yeah, equality issues on, on the ballot, and recreational pot in Colorado. I feel like my work is done. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll have a lot to talk about uh, with some terrific guests. Joining us today are Amy Webb, who is CEO of Webb Media Group, a digital strategy consulting firm that works with Fortune 500 companies. And she's the author of a new book, Data, A Love Story, How I Gamed Online Dating to Meet My Mate. Sarah Seltzer is a freelance journalist, a regular contributor to the Forward Sisterhood blog, and this year's Journal Fellow for the Laba Jewish Arts Fellowship at the 14th Street Y. And Jenny Rosenfeld is here from Israel. She's the co-author of Et Le Ahov, The Newlyweds Guide to Physical Intimacy. And before making Aliyah, she was director of Yeshiva University's Salem program, which helps to increase sex ed in the Orthodox community. Um, those of us who live in, uh, in the Northeast suffered uh, tremendous storm in the last few weeks. Hurricane Sandy swept through, leaving unfortunate deaths and devastations in uh, New Jersey, New York. I know for us at The Forward, the building that we work in was badly flooded. Uh, we haven't been able to enter it to work, and we may not get back there for weeks, maybe even months. Sarah, on the Sisterhood blog, you've been writing about the, the bigger consequences of a storm like this. Tell us what you've been thinking. Well, I think the fact that it happened in the Northeast where, you know, politics and media are centered has brought a couple of big issues to a lot of people's attention that maybe were on the back burner, and one of those obviously is global warming. And is this our, is this our new reality? Are we going to be dealing with these super storms? you know, once a year, frequently all the time. Um, people living in low-lying areas have to reconsider where they live. And But the, the really, the, the even bigger issue that kind of goes hand in hand with global warming is, of course, who always suffers the most during these catastrophes and these awful um, weather incidents. In Katrina, we saw that it was, you know, there was a real division between poor residents of New Orleans, and we're seeing it happen again in New York. Um, there are these high-rise projects and housing complexes in the Rockaways and Coney Island, um, where elderly and poor residents are trapped without power, without food, without blankets. I went out to Coney Island this weekend, and I know a lot of Jewish organizations um, and volunteers have been out um, just shuttling blankets up and down. And it's just really shocking to see not just what happened after the storm, but what people were lacking before the storm to begin with, mm -hmm. and how New York City really is a very, very divided city. And it wasn't just the division between those who had power and those who didn't, but really a division between who had somewhere to go and something to do after the storm and those who didn't. And a lot of these people aren't, are afraid to leave their homes, however devastated they may be, because of looting. Because a lot of people experienced in Irene uh, in those areas, their mm -hmm. looting went on. And Irene was not n nearly as devastating, but the fact remains that when you have so little and you've been able to mm -hmm. you know, gather what few possessions you have, you're very reluctant to go somewhere. I, mean, I, I do think it's fair to say that it's not just poor people who've been badly affected by, by this storm. I mean, we uh, have a reporter on our staff who lives in a modest house in New Jersey and hasn't had power for a couple of weeks, has you know, two little kids, has had to relocate. I think, though, to your point, it's the, it's the idea of having options that makes the distinction exactly. here. Exactly. Listening the, to what you said and listening to what 
you said um, is emblematic of an important point, I think, that we saw, which was that um, the story was reported um, in very different ways, but everybody focused on Manhattan at the beginning, and obviously there were dramatic pictures and it was very interesting. Um, the Rockaways in Staten Island were pretty much forgotten uh, until very long into the process. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting. We sort, of, we sort of center our attention and focus, and so a lot of the coverage winds up being in a, in a place where that we're all familiar with. And um, there was a lot of, you know, there were, there were a lot of horrible things happening outside of Manhattan that um, we didn't hear about until really late in the process. And so it took a longer time to catalyze concern and action, around, you know, in the Rockways and in Staten Island. I, I, I think so, but if I may defend my profession for a minute, um, it was really hard to do any reporting there. You couldn't get there. There mm -hmm. was no public transportation. There was no gas. But that's um, where social media comes into play because the reality is that there were plenty of eyewitness accounts coming across Twitter and Facebook and, you know, th this again, is not... the concentrations of those would have been from, you know, from, the, like, the media centers. Yeah, like, probably mm -hmm. less people from Staten Island. Certainly there were tweets from all of those areas. And, but I, I do think that... It, it wasn't so much that it was Manhattan centric, although you're very right that those were all of the dramatic stories. Because there was, you know, uh, Breezy Point, the devastation that happened at Breezy Point. Yeah. That was it. Wasn't like people mm -hmm. ignored that at the beginning. Yeah. It was like a very focal thing. I think that though in these stories, it just point, it does take time to for them to unfold, and we saw yeah. that with Katrina yeah. too. I, I think too that there there's a distinction in that. The stories in Manhattan, while some of them had to do with residences, a lot of it had to do with, with the business community, with commerce. And, and the marathon. A, 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 and the marathon. Mm -hmm. um, so it's two different things. I think there was the, the personal human suffering in places like Breezy Point where, where houses went up in flames and um, far rockaways. And then the kind of issues that we confronted, which had to do not as much with our personal um, situation, although certainly I still have members of my staff who are without power, but with the fact that we can't get to work <laughs> and we have to figure out how to work otherwise. And I think and the, the larger are. thing is that w does the disasters, as you say, are only going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. And th so the devastation will be everywhere. So it won't just be we're going to focus on one area or another area. It'll be everywhere. Like when you think about the tsunami in 2004, like it's that. I hope we never see anything of that scope again, mm -hmm. but the reality is that you're dealing with things that are, are too big for the brain to grapple with all at one time. So we saw at the end of the storm this interesting uh, pairing of President Obama <laughs> and New, York, New Jersey Governor Christie, um, and also the beginning of some serious conversation about climate change. What do you think? Do you think that now that the election is over, this kind of issue is going to actually be something that people are going to be talking about? You know, we're, we live in information shadows. So whether we're um, actively engaging in television or reading a paper or being inundated through social streams, you know, we only have the capacity to follow a certain number of pieces of content or stories at a time. This election was very much about the economy um, and later about women's role. <laughs> in life and government. Um, so, you know, as much as um, we've seen the environment be a, maybe on the periphery, but part of um, elections and in, in campaigns in years past, there just wasn't uh, room for that dialogue in this election. And I, I don't know that it's going to be a major focal point in campaigns going forward. Um, it's not a, you know, as devastating as, as Sandy was, and we had a winter storm in New York, we had a derecho, like, in the mid-Atlantic. You know, these are all issues that we're confronting, but um, what is the day-to-day -day concern for most people in this country for the time being? You know, it tends to be, um, you know, reproductive rights, um, you know, religion, and, uh, and the economy. I just wanted to find out the, like, the, the global take on it, like, how much of this is an, is, is an issue in Israel? Like, are people in Israel worried about global warming? Are they worried about climate change? I think that there are. Um, you know, there are groups that are interested in it, but the average individual on the street in Israel, I think, is more concerned with the security situation because, I mean, here it's economics. Their security is the... Um, right. So we just completed this election learning that probably about 69 to 70 percent of um, American Jews voted for the president voted Democrat, which is probably about four to five percent 
uh, down from 2008. Um, what does this mean about the Jewish vote? Th 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 this was an election about the economy. So the economy really did trump all other big issues. I, you know, um, it trumped Israel for Jews. It trumped religion for evangelicals. Um, you know, th there were a number of people voting for Obama because they were concerned about what a Romney administration would mean for their bottom line, for their checkbooks, and for their health care, and for their taxes. Um, you know, we'll have to see what happens in the next four years and the relationship as it develops between our country and Israel. And you well, know. One of the things that we've seen is that American Jews seem stubbornly democratic. We, uh, we hear from some polls that Americans living and able to vote in Israel uh, for the American election uh, were favoring Romney. Um, Jenny, how, what do you make of this uh, distinction? I mean, I think on a purely selfish level for Israelis who are living, for Americans who are living in Israel, um, the number one issue or the only issue on the agenda is really will this president be good for Israel or bad for Israel? And though some may think that Obama was good for Israel, I think that a view in Israel that was kind of the majority was that he was not. Um, and so people were throwing their vote in with Romney, kind of regardless of other issues. I mean, I think it's been fascinating. I spend a lot of time looking at um, the, the numbers of Jewish voters in each presidential election since, you know, FDR, and they never really change that much. I mean, they do change with the tide. So if, you, you know, less people were voting for Obama in general, he won with a smaller margin, so Jews kind of followed suit. But overall, it's always, you know, very much, um, 70 to 80 percent. You know, when, when Reagan won with a landslide, it was more like 60 percent. But um, that, it's was a, that was another economic, example, right. example of sort of going with the tide. But, you know, I think that, you know, for, for most of us, the, you know, these issues of social justice are as important to our Jewish and American identities as what's going on in Israel. And there's also the second tier, which is that, to, you know, um, there's this strong backlash, I think, against believing that a vote for Likud is a vote for Israel's security. I think that there are a lot of us, certainly in the progressive Jewish community, who think that we'd like to see someone who's a little tougher with Israel, um, and that we think that's good for Israel and that's good for peace. So for us, you know, a vote for Obama might have been, a, in our view, a vote for Israel. But I also think most important is the domestic issues. Things like reproductive rights are so important um, to a lot a, of American Jews. There was a lot Jews. of quiet reaction from women who might exactly. not have been vocal about their opinions, but mm -hmm. when you're in the privacy of that voting booth, you're able to exercise a little bit of defiance. Well, we certainly saw that a couple of pretty right-wing uh, Senate candidates lost, uh, be in part, we think, because of um, rather unfortunate statements that they made <laughs> about The Republicans abortion. lost the Senate? because of, directly because of mm -hmm. uterine. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm yeah. wondering, you know, some of the statements that they made about abortion, about a rape, were just, were just wrong. I mean, it, it's not morally wrong or politically wrong. They were scientifically wrong. Um, Jenny, you've spent a lot of time um, teaching and writing about sex education in, in an observant community. Um, what do you make of this? I mean, could, should they have read your book? <laughs> Should they learn more? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that the issue of fear is so paramount. Um, and you see it um, in more right-wing Orthodox Jewish circles. You see it also um, in the stuff we saw before the election. Um, the fear that giving people an ounce of knowledge will kind of suddenly set them loose um, in terms of sexual activity. Um, Whereas we see that that's really not the case, that um, it is actually the opposite, where it's lack of knowledge that leads to the most um, sexually risky behaviors and unsafe choices. And knowledge really um, empowers people uh, to make better decisions. So how do you get that message across? You know, how, how do you do that in your community? Um, it's a struggle um, in terms of my personal trajectory. Um, I started out um, with a more action-oriented agenda uh, when I was working on Selim at Yeshiva University in terms of directly training um, educators, rabbis, leaders in the Orthodox community to have more knowledge um, of issues of sexuality. Um, and then eventually, when I made Aliyah, I took a step back and said, let me just write, um, because there isn't that same um, tension and politics when you're writing. Um, 
kind of sit and write and then put it out there and then um, and then the tension in politics comes <laughs> if it comes <laughs> right if, uh, if it comes and so leading from sexuality to dating um, we've just got to get in. Uh, go we have to get in this conversation about Amy Webb's uh, new book that is uh, going to be out in uh, January. Tell us a little bit about it, Amy. It's out January 31st, but by all means, please go pre-order it now on Amazon. <laughs> <and Amazon. laughs> uh, it is called Data: A Love Story, and um, the story is about how I gamed J Date uh, to to meet my husband. Um, I had been in some, I'd been in a bad relationship, and I was getting a lot of pressure from my family to go on J Date. And I did, um, and I, I went on horrifically awful dates with people who seemed online to be pretty decent human beings. <laughs> they weren't. They never are. <laughs> uh, but through this process, um, you know, one of the things that I, I learned, at least in terms of uh, religion and culture, is that algorithms, you know, can define along a certain set of parameters. Um, you know, but I, I refer to myself as being Jew-ish, um, which is that. Uh, you know, I may not be very religious, but the culture, um, you know, the way that I was, I was raised, all of those things are very important to me. Um, and it's, it was very important for me to find a partner who aligned very sort of exactly uh, along the same lines that I did. Uh, and that was really difficult. It was al also really difficult when I, uh, one night after having some wine, logged back into J-Date as, as a man to look at my competition and I realized, um, I realized that my competition was stiff. Uh, so it really transformed the way that I thought. And rather than waiting around and hoping that somebody would find me, I applied math, logic, and a whole bunch of spreadsheets um, to, to game the system. And he was uh, the, the first person that I, I found using that system was the last person that I went on a date with. And we've been married for four years. Wonderful. Well, that's a good uh, story. I don't know, we hear all about the Shidduch crisis in the Orthodox community and certainly issues with J-Date. I mean, what, what are we to make of all of this? I just this? love that you're, you're just naturally looking at me <laughs> as <laughs> though I would know. <laughs> well, I read I'm Amy's book, I though, <laughs> and it was, aside from being hilarious and very eye-opening, very eye-opening. I mean, it's, it's such a fascinating look at how we search for mates. And the key takeaway I got from, from Amy's book that I, I wish I'd read it years earlier was just to know, know what you want. Yeah. You know, not, not know what you, you think other people think you should want and what you want the world to think you can get. But like, know what you want. And then be totally okay with requiring it. Rather than me looking for somebody who was a certain height and would get along with my family, I created 72 very, very specific data points <laughs> right down to what, Whoa, like, wow. not just like, I wasn't just looking for somebody who liked Broadway musicals. They had to have these specific ones and they couldn't like other specific ones, like No cats, cats never cats. Yes. Never cats. <laughs> um, but that's, that's something that I think, you know, women, especially once you get to be a certain age, you start um, becoming fearful of making demands and feeling like you don't deserve to make those demands and... Because um, the world tells you right. that you don't deserve to make those demands. And dating culture naturally favors men. You don't want to get me started. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, but it's true. And the other thing that we're taught is that, you know, making the first move, you've probably found this, you know, making the first move is being, is being too aggressive. And, and the reality is that, um, it, you know, we, you know, it, it's, it's okay to make demands. It's okay to make the first move. Um, it's good to remember that just because you're online and things seem accelerated doesn't mean that they should be in real life. But regardless of whether it's a Jewish, ma you know, a traditionally Jewish ma matchmaker or an algorithm, the reality is that, you know, math, math and logic only get you so far. Um, generic formulas only get you so mm -hmm. far. You have to at some point figure out what you want and then take no prisoners and going after it. Wow. This is quite is this the kind of thing that you heard talked about a lot at Yeshiva University? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the truth is I'm listening to you and thinking that in the Orthodox world, people are saying certain similar things. I, I personally disagree in terms of knowing what you want um, to such a specific extent because I feel like you've got to be open to surprises. I guess it's the difference between how you met your husband and how I met mine, which was kind of out of the blue. Um, I kind of feel like sometimes um, when you're open to it, kind of something just 
person materializes out of thin air. And You're, I have been using that <laughs> logic for a very long time. <laughs> it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. And I guess there's different people, and that's why, mm -hmm. you know. I'm very demanding, yeah. so. <laughs> no, I, d I, do you think it may have something to do um, with your age? I mean, when you're younger, you're much less likely to have very, very specific and things. And experiences. It's not like I decided at 16 that I, you know, I, I, I didn't just invent this person. You know, I, I'm 38 years old. Um, and, you know, I was older when I, when I met my husband, but I had had a wealth of experience. I had lived all over the world. I had dated a whole bunch of people. Um, you know, and I was at a point where I knew what was going to work for mm -hmm. me and what wasn't, and I was not going to compromise anymore. Right. Andrew so, Lloyd Webber yeah. just didn't make the cut. <laughs> <Did not. laughs> I not. love yeah. Broadway musicals, and my husband hates them. And you know, this it's was a, not it's a big. This was a conflict. <laughs> this you know, was not a breaking point. Right. No, no, and, and I say, let me clarify. I say seventy-two um, attributes. I actually actually did use math and developed a system of weighted averages. So there was a top tier uh, of ten. <laughs> which were deal breakers and a secondary tier of 15. And so stuff like musicals didn't ultimately matter that much. If you read the book, it, it makes so much, her mad genius is so clear. It's and terrifying probably. <laughs> a little terrifying, a little daunting for those of us who are not so uh, genius-y. <laughs> well, ladies, I'm afraid that we um, have to end this conversation, even though obviously we could continue this for quite some time. Just and a, I few think a few more minutes of math, and I'm sure I could find a husband. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have Jenny and Amy's books that we all must read. Um, many, many thanks uh, to our guests today, uh, Amy Webb, Sarah Seltzer, and Jenny Rosenfeld. I'm Jane Eisner. Please continue the conversation on the Sisterhoods blog on the forward.com website. I'm Rachel Sklar. Keep on changing the ratio. And thank you for joining us at the Salon. Mm -hmm.